Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Juan's World. I had promised to do some cooking, but uh, I'm going to beg off. <laughs> I'm sorry. My cooking has been really quite ordinary for me anyway. I did make a fish pie, which is salmon and boiled eggs mixed up with mashed potato and baked. I've already given a recipe for that. And also my crumble this week is um, guava and lychees, all very straightforward. So I don't have anything particularly new to talk about. So instead I'm going to talk about words. And I'm also going to sing a song. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the vocabulary makes the song work. It's a traditional song from England, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the folk process in general. So let's start down that path. So let's just start by talking about words. You may recall if you've seen past videos of me talking about teaching English and also learning other languages that I've got a great deal of um, confidence in speaking another language if I have the right vocabulary rather than if I'm using correct grammar, which more often than not, I'm not. Uh, I'm certainly not capable of saying much very nuanced in other languages, maybe once in a while in French or in Spanish, I can pull it off, but I certainly can't in Khmer or Mandarin Chinese. I can barely speak them at all. But what I can do is hold fairly detailed, although limited, conversations in those languages, as long as my vocabulary is up to it. Somebody will meet me on the street, for example, or in a temple, and ask me who I am, what my name is, what I'm doing there, and all of that. And I don't really understand what they're asking me in detail. I couldn't translate accurately their questions. But as long as I can pick up a word or two here and there, I can make sense of it. So if I hear uh, what blah 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 work blah 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 blah, I know that they're asking me what I do for a living, and I can reply and so on. I just need a few words as anchors, so that my strategy in learning another language is to spend a lot of time on vocabulary and you know then of course add the grammar in as need be. Now when it comes to English for me the, the size of my vocabulary is really important. It's important for my writing as much as anything else because I find, let's say I'm, uh, I'm picking a topic and I'm writing about it, I find myself, if I'm not careful, repeating words all the time. And I have to stop and say, no, I've got to 
change that for variety because otherwise my writing is just flat and dull. But there's more to it than that. I'm also aware that if I'm not careful, I can just succumb to using meaningless intensifiers like very and really and so forth when I should be using a different word instead of the intensifier. This very old rule of thumb put forward by E.B. White in, um, in his work about um, writing effectively is that don't ever use very. Let's say very painful or worse still, like very, very painful. Say excruciating. Just use words that have more power and then your writing will have not just a more direction and more nuance but may actually also get at the point you're trying to make with more precision. So words for me are so vital, they're crucial to my writing and even as I'm speaking now I'm, I'm falling back on not saying very important, uh, really important, very very important because it doesn't help. Uh, I used to have a student from uh, the university where I used to teach uh, who had been in the army in the Rangers for many years and he became a journalist. Um, but all the time he wrote for me, he had one expletive, a four-letter word, which you know very well, which he just peppered his writing with because he felt it gave it more force. It doesn't. It gives it less force. Well, let's get into the song I wanted to sing for you. So this song is called Lady Isabel and the Elf Knight. It's part of what are known as the Child Ballads, a set of folk ballads that were collected by Francis James Child, hence Child Ballads, and they are each given a number. This one, Lady Isabel and the Elf Knight, has been collected in multiple versions, and I just happen to like this one. And I'll talk a little bit more about the story afterwards. I'll just mention at the beginning that this ballad is normally about a man who is conceived of as actually not human but an elf. And very much like Tolkien elf creatures, I guess called Lady Isabel and the Elf Knight, or also in this context called the Outlandish Knight. An outlandish knight from the Northland came, and he came a wooing of me, and he told me he'd take me to the Northern lands. And there he would marry me. She mounted on a milk-white horse, And he on the dapple-down grey, And away they did ride to the far riverside, Three hours before it was day, Said, unlight, unlight, my pretty Maiden, and light, and light, cried he, For six pretty maidens I've drowned it here before, The seventh one you are to be. She said, Go get a sickle to crop the thistle That grows beside the brim. That it may not mingle with my curly, curly locks, nor harm my lily-white skin. 
So he fetched a sickle to crop the thistle that grows beside the stream. She catched him about the middle, so small, and tumbled him into the stream, saying, Lie there, lie there, thou false-hearted knight, lie there instead of me. For six pretty maidens you've drowned it here before, the seventh one has drowned thee, and she mounted on the milk-white horse, and she led the dapple down grey, and away she did ride to her father's castle door, a little before it was day, and the parrot being in the window so high, a sea in the lady did say, What's the matter with you, my fair mistress? You tarry here so long before day. Oh, don't prattle, don't prattle, my pretty Polly, don't tell no tales on me. And your cage shall be made of the beaten gold, And your perch of the carved ivory. And the master being in the bedroom so high, A hearing the parrot did say, What's the matter with you, my pretty Polly, You prattle here so long before day. Oh, there came an old puss on top of my cage To take my sweet life away I was just calling on my mistress a dear To frighten that old puss away Lady Isabel and the Elf Knight. I'm not sure why <laughs> that song has been on my mind for a long time now, for days and days and days. When I'm out cycling or walking, I've been singing it in my head. Or once, a couple of days ago, I was singing it out loud <laughs> with a mask on. Uh, it's been a favorite of mine for a long time, I'm not sure why. But some of the diction is compelling to me. You'll notice that some of the um, vocabulary is a little bit odd. Some of the inflections of the verbs are also a little bit odd. For example, it speaks about her taking him by the middle and throwing him in the river and it says she catched him rather than caught him well catched is an old uh, and now obsolete uh, past inflection of catch all things that sometimes make me amused you can play with words that way you could say forgotted for example, probably would be better than what is now archaic when forgotten, N used to be the past inflection of uh, certain words like got, and gotten is still the past in US English, but it's no longer the case in British English. But there's other things in there that appeal to me a little bit um, by way of explaining how language can be uh, fertile. For example, the, the lady says to the parrot, don't prittle, don't prattle. Now, prittle and prattle are not <laughs> words we use every day, but they're useful words. Um, there's the noun, the 
combination noun, prittle prattle, which is a nice sounding word. It's kind of semi onomatopoeic. <laughs> now, you may know the word onomatopoeia, which means a word that sounds like the thing it is representing. So, for example, bang is an onomatopoeic word because bang sounds like a bang. Uh, I made up the word semi onomatopoeic, <laughs> and that's another useful way that you can uh, bend vocabulary to your purposes. That is, prittle prattle is not quite like what people do when they prattle, but prattle means like useless word. <laughs> Maybe you think that my talks are all prattle because they're not very useful. Well, I usually call them dribble um, <laughs> rather than prattle. But one of the things that interests me is that generally speaking, people's vocabulary differs in terms of what they understand versus what they use. Uh, it's true for me, it's true for everybody. I don't ever use the word prattle in everyday language or even in my writing, but I do understand what it means. The same is true of the second person singular that I mentioned last time, which also appears in this song where she says thou to the night. Um, and we don't use thou and thee anymore. But they do convey a certain quality. You remember last time I talked about how they convey a quality in religious utterances. They somehow give them more power or maybe more magic, I don't know. And there's another thing, and I'm going to talk about this more next time. I'm going to talk about what magic is and why magic and enchantment have such an appeal to people, particularly now. This song, The Outlandish Night, is vaguely enchanted um, when it comes to the knight, you don't really quite understand how he's an elf knight, but you certainly understand that the parrot is enchanted because you know, parrots don't really have conversations. They may be able to utter English words and maybe a short phrase, but they don't actually speak, and yet in this they do speak. So I'm going to just give you another cliffhanger here and say that next time I'm going to talk about enchantment and magic and what its appeal is in the modern world. And meanwhile, go ahead, tell your friends, like and subscribe, and I will continue on the road to enchantment next time.